Hey, you came back. This is the Toothpickings webcast. I'm Brian. I blog under Toothpickings and I do interviews underneath my house. This is my basement, aka Studio V. We are in lockdown during a pandemic, so what I do is I interview vampire scholars. And the vampire scholar today is Dr. William Hughes, Bloody Bill. He is a scholar from England, Manchester to be specific, and he is the co-founder of Open Graves, Open Minds. Open Graves, Open Minds is a fascinating project if you haven't heard about it. They uh, run symposiums and conferences and they publish scholarly work about the vampire in modern culture. Uh, Bill's going to talk about that as well as some of his own research and work in 18th century literature and how all of that intersects with his work with vampire literature. It's going to get pretty interesting, and a few times it's going to get a little controversial. At least, you know, what passes for controversy when you're talking about vampire literature. There are a few technical issues in this call. I apologize for that. Sometimes the audio and video gets a little stuttery. Uh, if you know the amount of technical hurdles we had to overcome just to make this interview happen, you will forgive all of that. Um, please be understanding. Uh, and I think what Bill has to say is interesting enough that the few issues are not that bad. I hope you enjoy. Thank you, Dr. Bill Hughes, for joining us here on this webcast. You do a lot of scholarly research, and uh, I think that's a lot of what we want to talk about today. And part of that is uh, a lot of your work is in uh, 18th century uh, literature, uh, a, a lot of the Gothic research and a lot of uh, paranormal romance, but then a lot of stuff that doesn't always strike me as uh, necessarily paranormal. Um, you've written some work on Jane Austen. How does how does that intersect with vampires? <laughs> well, it's kind of doesn't and it does. I mean, it, in, in a way, um, we just fell at both, both Sam and I did our PhDs in 18th century literature. And we just found ourselves doing this radically different contemporary 21st century paranormal romance. But there are links. I mean, Jane Austen, for one, I mean, you get some very obvious links that Jane Austen has now been repurposed as Jane Austen vampire novels of various kinds and mashups and so on. Um, and then there's a more, again, quite an obvious link is that her, her first novel, Northanger Abbey, is a parody, but a very sort of respectful parody of, of Gothic romances. Um, so there are those kind of links. And I think there you get, there's this kind of tension between 18th century mainstream literature, which is high, simplifying a bit, it's very highly rationalistic, and the Gothic, which of course emerges in the late 18th century, which is kind of um, sets itself against the idea of enlightenment. So, so that's always been a strain anyway, and you get to that to some extent in Austin. Um, so there are those kind of links, but then the, the 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 idea, for instance, that Gothic is always in some kind of questioning relationship with Enlightenment. So that that's one thing that's in the background. But then another, my, my sort of area of contemporary paranormal romance is that um, there you've got romance fiction in the loosest sense of romantic novels meeting up with the Gothic of the horror story. Um, and these two modes again, they're in a kind of uneasy tension. But one of the kind of paradigm texts for these novels particularly Twilight, is Austin's Pride and Prejudice. So that gets referenced throughout as the kind of model romance against which you get the Gothic elements pitted. So that's that's one of the strands, really. It seems like there's a, uh, a divide amongst uh, people I know. There, there's the people who love Pride and Prejudice and there's the people who love Twilight. I don't see them intermixing. Uh, I, I don't know a lot of people who love Pride and Prejudice and Twilight. Am I, am, is that just in my circle, or are there a lot of people who love both of them? I think uh, I think maybe the, the the people who read contemporary fiction don't often these days read classic fiction. Maybe there's that, but I think on the other hand, I think readers of like I said, Pride and Pre Prejudice is one of these kind of archetypal romance plots. So people who read Twilight because they like the they love the romance in it are very likely to to to, to like Pride and Prejudice. And like I say, that along with Wuthering Heights and Jane Eyre. Pride and Prejudice gets referenced a lot in, in Twilight particularly, but in lots of other romances of the same kind. So I kind of don't think there's that um, ex mutually exclusive. Um, so are we saying here that the people who uh, disrespect Twilight are actually disrespecting Pride and Prejudice? Oh, no, I wouldn't say that. Um, I mean, I'm, I, to be honest, I'm not a great fan of Twilight. <laughs> I, think, I think there are there are better, but not because it's paranormal 
paranormal romance, not because it's teen fiction, I just think it's not well written, but, and there are better paranormal romances, but I love Jane Austen, and I love Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights, but I think you, um, you, you're more likely, I think, to get, um, and this is a very gender divide, I think you're more likely to get people not, people who read Stephen King, for instance, are less likely to be reading Pride and Prejudice, but I think people who read the more romantic, the, where horror is tamed by romance, as in Twilight, I think they're quite likely the same audience who might well read Pride and Prejudice. Well, you mentioned uh, you mentioned some of Jane Austen's, especially Pride and Prejudice, being uh, uh, mashed up, and I wondered if you appreciated Seth Graham Smith's Pride and Prejudice and Zombies that came out a couple of years ago. Um, well, I thought it was. It, it, I don't quite get it. It was funny, uh, but once you've read it once, I think that's that's it. The joke's over. I'm not sure where I'd go with it after that. It didn't. To me, it didn't marry that kind of deeper exploration. It's just uh, the same with that. There is there's Emma and Emma and Va Emma and the vampires, and there are oh, a couple of others right down there. There are um, Jane Austen vampire where she survives 200 years and runs a bookshop in New York or something. Um, so, so there's, there's a number of them, but like I say, once you've, once you've got the joke, I can't see where you'd go from there. Okay. Well, on that note, um, where, where do you think these, uh, these older vampire stories from the past, uh, where do you see them overlapping with the newer vampire stories? You mentioned Twilight, um, but uh, remove Jane Austen from the picture for a second and, and, and take like Polidori's vampire or Dracula or some of those really uh, 18th and 19th century vampire stories. How did those, um, are those reflected in our more modern vampire stories? Um, well, of course, they're, they're radically transformed. I mean, I think you get, to, that's the distinctive thing. And it is, it, it is where this uh, genre of paranormal romance emerges is that horror um, suddenly meets um, the, the romance fiction as we know it. Um, whereas before that, Polydori's, Polydori's vampires is monstrous. Although he has that kind of, there's a slight suggestion of what's to come because he preys on women, he preys on innocent women. And Dracula, likewise, there's a sexual tension there, but most of all, he's, he's more or less monstrous. But what you get um, from Anne Rice's interview with the vampire in 1976 and then the uh, Francis Ford Coppola's film, Bram Stoker's Dracula, from, from that, those things on Buffy the Vampire Slayer Slay is a key text. Um, the monster becomes romanticised and becomes becomes humanised, and then even not just humanised, but becomes a lover as well as being sympathetic. It becomes a lover of human beings. So um, that's the radical change, I think. So they'll, they'll kind of preserve the law from the older stories and rework them in various ways, but they're also radically transformed by this encounter with romance fiction. Is there still room for a monstrous vampire today, or are fans now rejecting monstrous vampires in their stories? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think alongside the the romantic vampire that I've talked about, the humanized vampire, that you still got to get. There's still the need for for for, for monsters. Um, there's that cultural need to sort of displace all your fears onto some kind of outside object. And I think, obviously, I think the dominant one recently has been zombies, perhaps more than vampires. But you still get the horrific monstrous vampire. Um, existing alongside it, um, things like 28 Days Later, not 28 Days Later, what's it called? Um, oh, uh, 30 Days of Night, 30 Days of Night? Yeah, exactly, that's it, that's the one, yeah. So there's still going to be a need for the monstrous vampire, although, like I say, I think the zombies displace it. And yet, then, then in turn, you've now got romanticised zombies, so it's like, a, you know, something's going on in the world of monsters, I think. We're both simultaneously humanising them, but still needing new monsters. Well, it seems like even in the, the vampire tales that have the uh, romantic anti-hero vampire, there's still a big bad vampire that has to be yes, defeated. Yes, that's true, actually. Yeah, it's interesting. It's one of the things I've always noticed. There's always like, a, even among the civilized vampires of Twilight, you get the more vicious ones. Right. Um, and in, in Anne Rice's novel, you get the, the again, the hum, humanized sympathetic vampires, um, the, the sort of tortured aesthetes of, of Anne Rice's world. But alongside that, you get the degenerate vampires of Eastern Europe. So there's also got to be a, a monstrous monster further on beyond. And then, of course, don't forget that uh, part of the appeal of the sympathetic monster is that they're still very very dangerous there's always that tendency that they will lapse and 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 that of course is part of their thrill from from the romance side as the kind of dangerously predatory male which is one of the interesting angles of that kind of fiction i think you know it's funny it just occurred to me that uh i read uh the the authorized sequel to dracula that dacre stoker wrote with um ian holt and in it they had 
Dracula became the anti-hero and he had another big bad vampire who was the evil vampire and Dracula then became the nicer vampire. Yeah. So they, they set up that exact same dichotomy that is now very popular with uh, that vampire Yeah. That yeah. I, mean, I, mean, I suppose at the end of the day, you've always, always got to have heroes and villains, you know, and it, even if your heroes are a bit villainous, you still want somebody really villainous to, to face right. up against. So. But, but now both the hero and the villain are both vampires. And, yeah, but there's yeah. still there's still a human to kind of uh, give us entry into that world. But there's a there's a heroic vampire and then there's an evil vampire to to root for as well. Yeah. Uh, there's a question I got from a, a user on Amino, and it is, uh, what is the strangest story you have come across doing your research? Research and she was asking specifically about folklore. I know you you do a lot more literature, so I, I'm going to leave it up to you which one of those you might want to address, whether it's uh, a strangest folklore you've come across or the strangest vampire story you may have come across. Right. Well, oh, there's so many to choose from. I think um, I'll stay with the folklore. I mean, it's like, like I say, my, my main is, I'm not a folklorist. I'm not an anthropologist. But my interest is how that, those raw materials get transmuted into literary fiction. But still, I think one thing which... Um, it's all strange, of course, but one of the strangest things about the East European vampire is, is that one of the ways to defeat them is to get them to obsessively count something. They're obsessive counters. And, of course, that made its way into Sesame Street with um, Count von Count. But if, if you put a load of millet seeds around a vampire, you can distract him because he'll start counting the seeds. And that strikes me as just a very, very odd sort of detail. Um, and it's something that whenever I get around to writing my vampire novel, that's something I'm going to incorporate. But that's just a secret not to be divulged yet. Um, but that's just one of the oddities. It, of course, it's all odd and it's all fascinating. But... Do you think there might be a uh, room for like a goodwill hunting vampire, a, a, a vampire who is a mathematician? Well, that's kind of I was kind of thinking. Or did uh, I just give away the plot of your novel? <laughs> well, just a hint. I was thinking more of an accountant. I was thinking like that—that that kind of obsessive preoccupation with numbers. Um, in my novel, it would be allied with the, their dehumanized side. You know, their their monstrous side would be the fact that they're an accountant. I know that's a bit unfair to accountants, but uh, that uh, yeah, maybe there could be a mathematician or a or an accountant vampire out there. Yeah. That that would work. That would work. They would be uh, they would be obsessed with money, counting their money. Yeah, I, I think it all. It, yeah, I don't want to write your novel for you. You've got it. You, you've got it. One of the things you do get, though, that in, in kind of contemporary vampire things is um, vampires very frequently um, they've amassed quite a great wealth through, through obviously because they've lived long enough to do this. But they also seem to they're quite often portrayed as very canny manipulators of the stock exchange and investments and so on. So you get these sort of secretive vampires at the heart of society who are very, very, very wealthy. And that's quite a recurrent theme throughout all this sort of contemporary vampire fiction i think that may may go back to the accounting thing i don't know tell me uh, um i know we, we need to get into this to eventually because this uh is something you uh mentioned right at the beginning but tell me about open graves open minds um how did you get involved in that and what uh what need were you fulfilling when you helped co-found that with sam george um it was purely by accident i think as, as i was saying we started this is the project's been going 10 years now and Sam was teaching at the University of Hertfordshire and uh, she, just one of her students wanted to do a dissertation on Twilight because Twilight was still in the air very much at that time. Um, and she sort of, we kind of looked into it and we didn't, that, and that's when we stumbled on what that Twilight is just like the tip of the iceberg. There's, there's just an immense wealth of paranormal romances and these crossover fictions going on. I mean, in the, the past sort of 10 years, I've, I've read hundreds, you know, literally hundreds, um, and I forget them all because there's so many. Are, there's some very good ones, and so many are not so good. But from that, we just sort of developed it from there. It began with vampires, and we moved on to other kinds of um, like zombies and werewolves, and other kinds of crossovers between gothic and other areas of literature, really. So, but yeah, the initial seed was Twilight, and one student's interest in it. So. We brought in, our, as I said, we were both 18th century specialists before, and we kind of brought in that expertise alongside it in a way. But yeah, it just started by accident. Uh, what's the uh, what's the change you've noticed about vampires over the centuries um, as they've moved from uh, the 1800s up to the 2020s? Um, I'm not sure I could pinpoint like the, the more gradual shifts, but 
I think, I think again, the, the most crucial thing is this humanising of the vampire, which we've talked about before, which started in, say, the mid-70s and peaks in the 80s and 90s. Um, and I think that's a very significant shift, because it's not just a shift in the character of the vampire. Um, it's, it's a shift... Well, there's two things going on. It's, it's a kind of experiment with form, in a way. You're getting two sort of very different um, kinds of novel, the, the horror, no, horror fiction and romance fiction and then mating them together in the same way that the monster mates with the innocent young girl you know um so that's going on but it's i think it's also reflecting the way that um outsiders have become more gradually assimilated into western society so whereas dracula most notoriously could be seen as being anti-semitic or anti-gay and that what happens when when minorities are more recognized in um in society as they kind of were to an extent in the, from the 80s onwards. I think that's what's reflected. That's that's why that fusion occurs. Um, but interestingly, in some ways, it's not such a shift. If you go back to, to Polidori um, and to various... Uh, one of the seed texts for, for Polidori was um, Lady Caroline Lamb's memoirs of... Bi well, fictionalised memoirs of Byron, where she project, portrays somebody who's very vampiric um, and yet romantic. Um, so you, you've already got a kind of proto-paranormal romance even back there in the sort of late eight, late 18th, early 19th century. And Polidori was inspired by that, by that portrayal of Byron. And then recurring figures like um, Jane Eyre, Wuthering Heights, the, the dark brooding hero, is, again, is a kind of and through to Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca. These kind of dark brooding heroes do persist until they come full circle and become vampires again with Twilight and so on. Does that make sense? It's kind of it's a convoluted story, but there are these shifts. But yeah, coming back to your original question, the most basic dramatic shift is that shift of humanizing and romanticizing the vampire. I, I absolutely agree with you. I want to I want to try an addendum onto that and and see what you think. And it, and you might tell me I'm wrong, but it it seems like there's also a uh, a demand from audiences to have a more um, precise definition of vampires what they can and can't do what their what their weaknesses are uh in more recent fiction it seems like in the older fiction they what a vampire was was squishier what its abilities mm. were what it could do and it's it seemed like a vampire could do whatever it needed to be able to do to have the scene be creepy yeah, um, it could turn into a mist. It could be rejuvenated by the moonlight. Um, all kinds of things that modern audience, audiences would be like, wait a minute, that that doesn't really make sense uh, that it could function like that. I need a little more concrete detail. Uh, and modern audiences would want, you know, they don't necessarily need an entire bio biological breakdown. They would accept some sort of supernatural uh, abilities, but they would still want certain rules set out. Um, and I think hmm. it seems like earlier audiences were willing to have fewer rules and more mysteries. Do you see that, or am I kind of? I, I see. I see what you're that. saying. I'm not sure it's audience driven. I think. I think the one thing, again, you know, several things happen. Uh, the conflicting things happening here. But um, the original folkloric vampire. Um, is very indef indefinite. It overlaps with the witch, it overlaps with the werewolf, and so on. Then you get a kind of canonization of certain vampire traits in Dracula. Um, and I think it's with the screen, more not so much the novel, but the screen dominance of, of Dracula says these golden rules, like he has no reflection, um, he bursts into flame into sunlight, he's threatened by the cross, he doesn't like garlic, all those familiar things become like the, the definitive vampire. And then you get a further shift is that um, for, in various ways, people, kind of almost every contemporary vampire story you, you read or see on film, um, there is some reference to those things, garlic, mirrors and so on. And sometimes it's very it's done very deliberately to, to, to kind of make it more scientific. They'll sort of discard the more supernatural things and say, oh, what, the crucifix? No, it doesn't bother me, that kind of thing. Or no, of course I can, of course I can be captured on camera or be in a mirror. Or on the other hand, they'll make a play of that and say, explain exactly why um, they'll, they, you know, they'll highlight the reflection scene or they'll highlight the, the aversion to the crucifix and then go and explain it. So I think, I mean, maybe that's audience driven. Maybe audiences want some kind of explanation. And what you were hinting at, I think sometimes the explanation they want, in, in our age, which is very scientific age, but also sort of riddled with doubts and anxieties about science, people oscillate between wanting 
scientific explanation, like um, it's a virus, vamp- vampirism is caused by a virus, very pertinent now, of course, or they want an absolute supernatural explanation where it's, it's just mysterious and it comes from forces of evil beyond the natural world and so on. So all those kind of tensions emerge. And, and I mean, what you do definitely get, as I said, is authors very deliberately play with the received canon of what vampires do and what they're averse to and so on. Oh, I de- definitely agree with you that it was Dracula was the turning point between um, a much more open field for what the rules could be and then the narrowing of the rules, for sure, because that, that definitely set some rules in place. And And I would certainly agree with you that whenever those rules are changed in more recent stories, they're always defined in contrast. Someone always has to say, well, yes, we appear in mirrors or no, yes. ho- holy water doesn't bother us because what they have to yeah. make that statement that of course we are not like the vampires you saw on the movies before. They have to make a point of that. Very often it's, it's, it's done to heighten the realism of the story because they say, oh no, those are just legends, but we're the right. real vampires and yes, here's, you know, here's some garlic I'm eating, you know, that kind of thing. So you so say, yeah, I mean, well, that's one of the tricks to, to make the novel sound realistic is uh, dis- um, disengage it from the folkloric heritage, I think, in that way. Let's uh, talk a little bit more about uh, Open Graves, Open Minds. You guys do symposiums. Uh, that is that the right word for uh, the, the conferences uh, you hold? We've had symposia. We've had conferences. Um, I should have I should have pointed if I can. That that was the the first book that came out was our book on vampires. So that's that came out in twenty. 2012, I think, and that was after a big vampire conference that we had, and that it, that's 10 years ago now. So 2010, we had the conference. That book came out in 2012, and that was the that was the the beginning of the Open Graves, Open Minds project, as Ogon, as we call it. Um, and yeah, we've been since then. We've had um, symposia on Bram Stoker and Polidori, and we've had conferences on werewolves, on vampires, on um, the supernatural city, various things like that. And you've written about a, a bit on werewolves yourself, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I was curious. I wanted to ask you specifically about um, the, uh, crossing werewolves and vampires. Uh, is that something that's only been a more recent tradition in fiction, or does that go back further than just uh, Universal Pictures trying to cash in? Um, well, I think the, the thing is that... Um, in the original folklore of East European vampires, in the kind of the, the, the vampire panics of the late, early 18th century and so on, before it became a literary device, you couldn't really point to any difference between werewolf, as I said before, werewolf, witches, vampires, the same words were used for each, they swapped characteristics between them. I think it's only our more kind of modernist urge to classify that has made those distinctions. But if you're talking about the, the, the actual kind of world where they both mingle, as you say, you've got the the universal crossover things. Um, I think it, it's, I don't know if there's a gap, whether that stopped happening, um, but certainly in the, the for paranormal romances that I've looked at, almost sooner or later, even if it starts off as just a vampire, other, other supernatural creatures appear, um, werewolves appear. In the Suki Stackhouse novels, um, you, you get fairies appear and, and so on, you know. Um, so it's kind of once you've opened up the world to supernatural beings, they'll all start prowling around and leaping in in some form or other sooner or later. So, yeah, I think that you, 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 you rarely get ones these days that have just vampires or just werewolves. The, the other supernatural beings eventually merge. And, and I think that's where... Um, one of the things in our latest book, which is on the werewolves, um, one of our contributors, Victoria Amador, talks about the lower class status of the werewolf. And so one of the reasons for bringing werewolves and vampires together is that vampires always represent something very sophisticated um, and, and generally aristocratic. Um, and werewolves are seen as very working class and or, or even a different race, as in Twilight, where they're American Indians. So the, they're used for the different kinds of beings represent different attitudes to society and different nature. Um, and to nature and bringing them into dramatic um, action with it, with each other sort of explores all those different angles I think to, ma- to make this sexual because why shouldn't we um, vampires uh, I've always been told represent seduction and werewolves represent rape Is you find that to be accurate in uh, um, all the literature no 
I don't think so. I mean, okay, well, no, I mean, no. Tell, tell me more. No, because Dr- Dracula, Dracula is a predator. Um, a lot of the earlier vampires are definitely predatory. Um, and again, I think, I, I think perhaps. There's so much variety among the texts. I don't think you can really come to that conclusion. But yes, it probably does get get expressed that way in some texts. Um, but I think the significance is that although vampires are definitely seductive, it's it's almost a kind of um, bodiless seductiveness, despite all the enhanced passion that that say Bella gets from Edward Cullen and that. They're kind of bodiless in a way that way werewolves aren't. I mean, werewolves precisely because of that animality and their transition between human and, and animal they, they can express a kind of sexuality that is different from the vampires it's more it's just definitely more more physical and definitely more earthy um and that brings all sorts of problems alongside with it when you get to the position of women in the werewolf pack and so on all sorts of odd things start happening that make it not quite as progressive as, as it might be uh let me jump back to what you were saying before um you were saying that the werewolves represent uh usually a more working class whereas vampires represent more upper class. Why do you think if if vampires tend to represent wealth and werewolves tend to represent a uh, working class, why do you think so many more people have an affinity for vampires who would represent the, the 1% than werewolves who would much more likely be reflecting of the masses who are reading them? I know maybe aspirations to go beyond what people are confined to. You know, so I mean, who wouldn't want to be if 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 you are like a, one of the werewolves is just um, a kind of blue collar mechanic in in a rundown village, or you you're an aristocrat with lots and lots of wealth and a big big shiny new house. Why wouldn't you go for the vampires? <laughs> so I, I think yeah, there's that aspiration beyond um, what you've got. That's one one of the promises of vampires is that they've, they've not only got eternal life, they've got wealth, they've got um, incredible glamour, they've got fabulous sexual appeal, and so on. You know, so one of the things about all these fictions in some way are offering a kind of utopian glimpse of going beyond the ordinary human to something potentially bigger. You know. And so vampires are glamorous in that way. Werewolves are glamorous in another way because they they represent that kind of unbridled freedom and that kind of um, immersion into nature that has its own kind of appeal. So and let's be clear about something though. There there's nothing in the folklore that dictates that vampires should be wealthy and live in castles, or that werewolves oh, necessarily no, should be should be poor. The, it, it it would just somehow. Somehow it just got determined in the fiction that this was the way it was going to be. How did that come about? I think purely that accident of Polidori um, taking his revenge on Byron um, by making, fusing the vampire with the story of, an, of a, a predatory aristocrat, you know, a predatory, cold blooded, um, egotistical aristocrat. So I, I, I don't see that it kind of come about any other way it was just purely that that seminal piece of fiction that because it was so popular um because polydoria's story of the vampire inspired lots of stage plays in england and in france and then more stories in germany and throughout europe so it became a sensation and and then the, by accident he'd he'd uncovered something particularly appealing about um the, the aristocratic vampire and that persists of course um to the present day so you think if, if perhaps Somebody wrote a a really super popular vampire tale where the vampires were middle class folks. Uh, that could potentially change the genre. If Anne Rice had 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 middle class vampires instead of upper class uh, regal vampires, maybe things would look different today. Maybe, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> That's just, just a what if, but <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's just like a. Can you make a middle class vampire attractive? That's the thing, you know. It's, again, it's, it's like because, because um, the kind of fictional image of the aristocrat with all his glamour and wealth and that is just attractive in itself. But you fuse that with a vampire and you've got something very interesting going on. Uh, let me ask a question off of Amino. Ragged Robin asks Why do you think humans compulsively tell stories about monsters? And have you noticed any changing trends? And how we relate to monstrous characters and stories versus how we used to. Mm. Um, I think that's I've, I've kind of said this partially before, but the the monster is always the, the, that thing that um, that we feel threatened by that we can't tame, um, the thing that's outside us. 
So sometimes it's fears of uh, our own drives, although they're, they're transmuted in a way that they seem to be outside us, like sexuality or violence or whatever. Sometimes, regrettably, they're they're kind of groups of groups of human beings that we've we've elected to to fear or hate. So as I say, Dracula. Dracula embodied, Dracula embodied all sorts of fears about, about immigrants and about deviant sexuality and so on. Um, but there's always going to be... Uh, the the vampire fiction of the 80s was very often a response to the AIDS crisis. So, again, it's the fear of the body turning against you. There's, we all, we're, we're always going to have fear um, and we're always going to tell stories and many of those stories are going to be about embodying those fears as, as characters, as agents within the stories. So I think that's how it is. And as I say, I think the changes that we've seen have been the, the sympathetic monster, although, as you were saying before, there's always another monster outside that. But a lot of those things we feared have now become reconciled to society and become sympathetic, although still with an edge of, edge of danger. So that's that's the shift I see that's happened. Um, let me ask you another question off of Amino. Um, uh, Luca Alcroft asks this one as well. Uh, I'm paraphrasing this a little bit. Why do vampire scares track so well with outbreaks of disease? And why do vampires across different cultures and geographies seem so similar if the only commonality is disease? That's a tricky one because I'm not so sure I agree with the, the initial premise. I'm not so sure that they are consistently or frequently um, associated with outbreaks of disease. I think the only... The only strong example of that that I can think of is like I say in the, the 80s where uh, vampire fiction was associated with, um, with the AIDS epidemic but outside of that I'm not sure I'm not so sure I mean if if you were to give some examples maybe I'd be persuaded but well, when we were talking earlier uh, pre-interview you said that you thought that vampires were only associated with one time and place what did you mean by that I meant and this is the answer to the second part of the question that uh, to me, vampires are not um, found all over all cultures in all ages. I, I think you, I think it's a danger of um, losing the particularity and the individuality of different kind of folkloric and mythological motifs if you say that they're all, all vampires. I think vampires are specifically this East European folkloric thing um, that was drawn to attention was drawn to during the kind of early 18th century when there was a, a big vampire scare. I think beyond that, they're not vampires. They're something else. You know, they they may be revenants of some kind. They're things that come back from the dead, or they're they're things that sap your life force. But the idea of um, the thing that dies and comes back to life and sucks your blood, I think that is specifically folkloric in that one period period and place. And then even more specifically, it's a literary construction. Because even even the word vampire itself is like um, it's very hard to pinpoint when that occurred. But it's it's specific to a particular time and place and it only enters into languages about that kind of that, that period so i just think there's very dangerous it's very dangerous to kind of assimilate all myths across the world it's just one one mm -hmm. common kind of thing or to spot vampires from the dawn of human history onwards as um i, I know people have done this in the past like montague summers and so on but i think it's um it does damage to the individuality of the stories themselves i think amongst other things I, I've read different accounts, and and I've read uh, certainly experts who say no, the, such and such cultures did not have any kind of vampire. And then you'll read introductory uh, books that say every culture had a vampire. Mm -hmm. And I think oh, one of these folks is wrong. And I I'm thinking that the introductory people who made the blanket statement are probably wrong. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think any blanket statements are, are probably wrong. But uh, yeah, I think the I think the as I say, they do in, injustice to the individuality and to the specific, specificity of different cultures. Um, it's, there's a kind of imperialism there that's just like making everything into one throughout time and across geography. And I think that's, it's it's not just a dangerous thing to do. I think it's quite an uninteresting thing to do because everything gets flattened out then. Um, mm -hmm. And you're not finding all the curious differences between things. So uh, not to dismiss your questioner's question completely, but I, I would say just be, I'm just not so sure that, there is that similarity across cultures, basically. There is a uh, something I read online in relation to the Open Graves, Open Mind project that I think some people might be very interested in, especially some younger viewers. Is there such a thing as a vampire degree that you can get 
<laughs> in England as a result of Open Graves, Open Minds? Well, yes and no. I mean, there's, uh, throughout the world, there's, there's been um, for a couple of decades, the Gothic studies is, appears on lots and lots of English literature syllabuses, um, curricula, and there are MAs in, in various universities in Gothic studies. But what was unique was what, what Sam began uh, around 10 years ago was uh, her MA module, um, which is called, let me get the thing for this. Um, it's called Reading the Vampire, Science, Sexuality and Alterity in Modern Culture. And that was a, that was a genuine first to actually have a, a full module devoted to vampire studies. But it's not the entire degree. You'd have to do an MA in English literature at the University of Arts and take that one module. Um, but having said that, it's now going to go online within the next year or so. Um, and you, with Sam's thinking, it will be available as, as a single module. So you won't get, won't get a degree out of it, but you'll, have got, you, you'll be able to take a course online in vampire studies. And it's a very good one. And it will give points towards an MA, so should you want to go down that path as well. I think there may be other places that have now started doing single modules in vampire studies, but I'm pretty sure there's not a whole MA on it. I'm not sure that would be a good idea. It'd be too too narrow in a way. And just to be clear, it's not going to turn you into a vampire. It's going to help you study vampires. It's going to help you study vampires and have interviews with vampires, yeah. And, and interviews with vampires, of course. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Dr. Bill Hughes, thank you so much for joining us. Uh I'm sure you're probably sequestered at home like the rest of us. Yeah. You're, are you sealed inside your coffin like so many of us? <laughs> I am, yeah. And I don't see daylight much anyway at the best right. of times. So, yeah. Can I just give a plug for our latest book, though? Because, um, as I said, we had a we had a, a conference on, on werewolves was the last one. And from that, um, we developed this very beautiful book. Can you see that? Uh, yeah, that looks great. Oh, that's beautiful. Yes. Yeah. It's a just gorgeous cover. Um, that's from Manchester University Press, and it's in the company of wolves, werewolves, wolves, and wild children. So it covers three themes about not just the werewolf, but the wolf that, it, that the werewolf turns into, and wild children who are often thought to have been raised by wolves. And so it's a very comprehensive series of articles that fit together um, on all, all things wolfish and werewolfish. What we'll do is we'll put a link to that uh, at the bottom of the screen, un underneath the video, so yeah. anyone interested can take a look at that. We'll put a link to Open Graves, Open Minds as well. And uh, hopefully some people will find the interest to look into that. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of crossover interest for anyone who's interested yeah. in vampires who also look into werewolves. Yeah, and if they want to just follow us on the um, on our website generally or follow us on Twitter, um, they'd be very welcome. And, and we cover all sorts of areas. Like We're moving into dark fairies, and that's probably going to be the next conference. So... Um, all those, all those kind of crossovers between folklore and literature and the fantastic are, are what we deal with, basically. I'm the, I know there's got to be a, a rich vein to mine there between... You've already done werewolves, dark fairies, witches. Um, what else? Uh, mummies, invisibilia. Um, what else yeah. can be coming up? Uh, one of our members on the Ogon Project, uh, Daisy Butcher, who's studying her PhD supervised by Sam, is, is doing Victorian mummies and uh, the sort of lore and fiction associated with that. So, yeah, definitely. And mermaids. We like mermaids. Mermaids. Yes, of course. There's a lot there. OK, well, thank you very much, Bill Hughes, and stay safe. And we'll talk to you again soon. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Nice All to right. meet you. Anyway, Bye. See you. Thank you so much to Dr. William Bloody Bill Hughes for being on this show. I'm putting some links down below. Please take a look. Uh, a lot of scholarly stuff there. It's going to keep your mind working overtime reading some of those things. Uh, very good stuff. The Open Graves Open Minds Project has rich material. And take a look at the Ogom Twitter as well. Uh, every day or so, they post really interesting folklore. Uh, things I had never seen before. Um, really interesting images and tidbits on old folklore about fairies, werewolves, vampires, revenants. Uh, all of it really intriguing. Uh, and like I said, a lot of things I'd never heard before. Uh, good stuff. So thanks for joining me. Please stick around. We'll do another one of these. As long as the pandemic is keeping me inside, I'm going to keep putting things out for you. And remember that the best defense against the pandemic is the same as the defense against a vampire. Distance. Keep it away. Away. 
See you around.